a lot of webinars and a lot of safety moments over time. And we realized recently we hadn't addressed office safety in one of these. Uh, and so here we are today. We're gonna talk about some basics uh, for office safety. We're gonna talk about some of the types of accidents we see most often in office spaces, as well as some of the most common hazards uh, that we identify in offices. Uh, I think it's probably not too much of a stretch of the imagination to, to realize that talking about accidents in the office, slip trips and falls are probably some of the most common ones that we see, but there also are the ergonomic issues, musculoskeletal injuries. Sometimes there can be, you know, some strains from lifting, but also things that result from repetitive motion and other ergonomic issues. We also see a lot of uh, hazards that have to do with fire safety and life safety uh, in the office. And so we'll touch on those as we go through here today. So let's start out talking about the slips, trips, and falls. Uh, you know, one of the most basic things that sometimes is easy to overlook or is our office furniture itself. We have those drawers on our desk that come out or sometimes it's file cabinets or doors on cabinets overhead. Uh, that often get left open and, it, and you might stand up and whack your head on an open door or you might uh, walk out and trip over an open drawer. Also, those open drawers can cause your file cabinets or, or other office furniture to become unstable and tip over. So it's a really good idea to remember to keep those drawers and those doors closed at all times. Uh, another thing that we see just kind of has to do with housekeeping. Lots of times we have more stuff than what we know what to do with. Uh, and so we can get some clutter. Sometimes there's a lot of boxes or other things that uh, wind up near our desk or in the walkway that can create a trip hazard. And so, you know, addressing those housekeeping issues and those storage issues are really important. Make sure we keep those walkways clear. Uh, and also think about not just what's underfoot, but what's overhead. Often how we store things can result in a hazard. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second here. Cords is a, is a big area where we see a lot of uh, issues, uh, cords that get stretched across the room, around the desk, especially when they cross a walking path, uh, can create a trip hazard. And even cords under the desk, every year we see uh, incidences where people get their feet tangled up with cords under their desk and it causes them to fall when they get up. And so, you know, keeping those cords uh, you know, together using cord keepers uh, to manage those cords can be really helpful. Uh, and how you arrange the office furniture is important too. Uh, if we put the desk away from the wall where the outlets are, then obviously we're going to be pulling cords across the room. A lot of our offices don't have sufficient uh, electrical service you know, for the amount of electrical equipment that we use these days. So uh, if you can get an electrician in there and provide you some additional uh, electrical outlets where you need them is a really good idea to help you keep those cords away from your feet and away from your walking areas. Another thing that we see a lot of is, is doormats. Uh, a lot of doormats get damaged, torn. A lot of them just kind of will curl up on the edges. You know, they come from the, the service and they clean them, they roll them up tight. And then when they get to us, you know, they want to roll. And so they stick up on the edge and create a trip hazard. We want to make sure we keep those down. Your chair mat is another thing on the floor that can get often cracked and can result in, in some trip hazards and just general wet slick floors and that's why we want to have the doormats when it's uh, when we get some rain and snow a little bit later on not too long from now we want some place to dry those feet when we come in so we don't get that water all over the tile uh, or other surfaces that could get really slick so pay attention to those uh, those conditions carpets rugs and we talk about other flooring conditions rugs can get snags or tears in them uh, that can create trip hazards or sometimes it's even just tile or other aspects of our flooring that comes loose and pops up and can create a trip hazard so we need to keep an eye on our floors make sure we eliminate those trip hazards another one that we see a lot and please, 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 I, I, I can't emphasize this enough. Please don't let me read any more work comp claims about someone who fell off of a chair, uh, standing on the chair. Yes, sometimes people do fall off the chairs when they're sitting down. Um, uh, you know, that chair comes out from under them, but you know, really hate to see the ones where we're using the chair for a ladder. 
So let's make sure and use the right tool for the job. Chairs are for sitting on. Your desk is for your work surface. Uh, not Those things aren't for standing on. And I know lots of times we think, well, I'll just get up on that chair real quick. It'll just take me a second to reach what I've got to get, and I'll get down. But uh, that's all it takes. And so let's make sure we have some step ladders available in the office when we need to reach things up on a high shelf or someplace where we can't get to them. Make sure that step ladder is the right size for the job. Make sure it gets you up high enough, uh, but not too high. We you know, want to have something that's just right for the job there, and it needs to be something that's made for the weight that you're going to be putting on it as well. One with a handle that you can hold on to when you're, when you're standing on it is a great thing. And remember, try and stay off those top steps. Uh, the condition of the ladder is really important. If your step ladder has been damaged, if it's wobbly, if the supports are bent, you know, let's get rid of that thing and get one that's in good condition and have enough. If you've got a one step ladder in your office and someone comes around and borrows it and then you can't find it, then, you know, you're likely to be tempted to step up on that chair again real quick. So let's make sure we have enough of them around so they don't walk away and disappear. Stairs is another area where we see problems in the office. Uh, we actually have seen some pretty bad claims and, and uh, not too long ago with people falling down stairwells in their office buildings. It's really important that you be able to see where you're going when you're going up or down stairs. So it's really uh, important not to be carrying so much in your hands that it's blocking your vision of the steps and where you're walking. When you're carrying stuff in your hands and you're going on the stairs, you don't have a hand free to get a hold of the of the railing of the of the handrail. So I would really recommend if you have to carry things up and down the stairs, if you have an elevator available to you, use the elevator for getting stuff, materials and equipment and other things that you may need to carry up to the upper floors rather than carrying them up the stairs. I love going up and down the stairs for exercise, and I like to avoid the elevator when I can. But if I'm carrying stuff. You know, it's a real good idea to make sure and use those stairs. You can also use carts or dollies or hand trucks or things to help you carry them, which can reduce the risk of having a sprain or strain from lifting uh, those, those objects as well. Stairwells are not storage area. So be really careful, you know, not to leave anything on the steps. And we do see this every now and then, especially in stairwells going down to the basement. Or other things like that. Let's try. Let's try really hard. Get those things, you know, stored in the storage area. When they're on the steps, they just create an extra trip hazard. And I do not want to fall on the stairs because if I fall on the stairs, I'm likely falling to a lower level, which is going to be a much longer fall with greater injury. Make sure you use the handrail when you're using steps. You know, we put a handrail there for reason. Uh, and that's so that you can catch yourself if you need to or to help stabilize yourself as you're going up and down those stairs. And make sure you can see the steps, you know, make sure you can see the stairs when you're walking up and down those stairs. Another way to think about slip trips and falls is just from the perspective of things that may fall on us. So look in your storage areas. I know storage is always at a premium. We never have enough storage, but we need to be careful about how we store the items that we do have so that they're on shelves, they're secured, they're not gonna fall off a top shelf. And there's a couple of different ways we can do this. Number one, we can think about how well we place the items on the shelf, uh, whether they're on the correct shelf. We don't wanna put stuff that's heavy or really unstable up on a high shelf, that'd be much better on a lower shelf. But we also wanna make sure the shelves themselves are going to be uh, tip, aren't gonna tip over or wiggle. And so, you know, let's make sure we store things on the shelves well, and then let's look at anchoring the shelves together, anchoring them to the wall, anchoring them to the floor, you know, anything we can do to give those shelves some stability to keep them from also tipping over. Any other long objects that you may have in your storage areas as well, especially like ladders, make sure we secure those so they can't tip over, uh, you know, unintended and cause an injury or damage. Let's talk a little bit about office ergonomics. You know, I mentioned this one just a second ago about how we store things. You know, let's make sure that when we are putting things in storage that the things we're gonna get at most often are 
in a place where they're easy for us to get at. So waist level, chest level, you know, is going to be the easiest to be able to grab things and be able to keep my body in a good posture without any awkward reaching or climbing. If we have heavy objects, let's try and keep those down lower where they're easier to get a hold of. Let's avoid, you know, having to get up on the step ladder to grab heavy objects. And then let's make sure that we are uh, positioning things in storage so that we can reach them easily without having to get on our tiptoes or reach out and get ourselves off or away from our center of balance. Uh, because not only are we more likely to fall, but we're also more likely to, to get, you know, a sprain or a strain, you know, a musculoskeletal injury, you know, from that awkward reaching. Now, if you spend a lot of your time at your desk sitting, it's important to think about how do you sit in a way that is going to help your body uh, while you're doing your job. Ergonomics is all about making your job and your workspace fit you, not you fit the workspace. So it's important that we have chairs and that we have tables and work surfaces and equipment that can be adjusted to each of our individual bodies. Each of our bodies are different. There's different proportions of the length of our torso and the length of our legs and our arms. It's called anthropometrics. Because we're all different, uh, we need to be able to customize you know, our workstations, especially if we spend a significant amount of time seated there. So chairs that can adjust you know, the height the tilt, the inclination, uh, to have adjustable armrests, you know, be able to raise and lower your armrest is a good adjustment to have. Uh, and it, as well as, of course, the height of your chair uh, are going to be important to make sure that you can get that chair adjusted for your body uh, so that you don't uh, get your body tired and you're not causing undue stress on your body. Uh, there's more than one way to do a job. And so we might want to be able to have multiple different positions that we can do our work from. So we're not in a static position for long periods of time. Organize your desk and your workspace with efficiency in mind. If you have to answer the phone a lot, you know, let's not have the phone, you know, across the desk where we have to reach for it all the time. And if we can have, you know, some sort of a headset or Bluetooth, if we spend a lot of time on the phone where we can answer it easily without having to reach at all, that's even better. Uh, and so think about that efficiency and avoiding reaching. We need to make sure we can do our job with our body in what we call a neutral position or you know, a, a neutral posture. A neutral posture is going to be one where our neck and our back are as straight as possible, where we can keep our head above our shoulders, in between our shoulders, not hanging out in front of our shoulders. It's also uh, going to be a posture where our limbs, where we have joints that are bending, can be used either straight or around a 90 to 120 degree angle. As you can see in this picture where we have this kind of x-ray picture of this person working, we see their skeleton, that angle at their elbow is much less than 90 degrees, okay? And that's going to cause undue stress on their body. Also, their wrist is going to tend to be a little more bent in that position, which makes it harder on the carpal tunnel as well. And so what we want is a, is a right angle to maybe a little bit more open than right angle. Your elbows, on your hips, at your knees, uh, and that's important for a seated, good, neutral posture. Let's look at some of the things in our workstation that we may need to adjust to do this. You know, if you look at the height of your monitor, that's a really import, important one because if your monitor is too low, then it forces you to look down. And if I'm looking down, my head winds up being out in front of my shoulders, which puts a lot more strain and stress on my neck and on my shoulders. If my monitor is up high, then it helps me keep my head up high and keeps my head above my shoulders. And there's a lot less strain on my neck that way. So having your monitor high enough that monitor screen is a pretty good rule of thumb. Having a document holder also that's up at that same height so that we don't have to look up at the monitor and then look down at a document. We want to be able to look over at the document at the same height. Again, helps keep our head high, helps us keep our neck up and keep our neck straight. We want to keep our shoulders back too. We want to, we want to avoid that hunching forward, that rounding of our back, because that also will result in additional stress on your back, especially between your shoulders 
and in that thoracic section of your spine. Chair needs to be the right height for both your arms as well as your legs. And this gets to be a bit of a tricky adjustment here. If your chair is too low, then all of your weight will be on your feet and your feet will hurt. If you get your chair too high, then all the weight of your legs is hitting on the back of your leg at the end of the chair, and that can also cause some discomfort. So you want your chair height adjusted so you have that right angle where your you know, leg is bent there and your back of your leg is supported by the chair, but your feet are flat on the floor also. So we're dividing the weight of our leg between the back of our leg on the chair and our feet on the floor. Sometimes we you know, can't do this and have the chair height right. So we get something to put our feet on. Uh, so you, you, you ha can get those little foot rests that will help elevate your feet so that you can get that right position there. We also want our arms to have that 90 degree to 120 degree angle when we're using the keyboard or writing on our desk. And so we may need to be able to adjust the height of our working surface, you know, depending on the chair adjustment and what our feet are on so that we have that, that right angle or maybe slightly wider than right angle on the elbow. We also want our wrist to be fairly flat while we're working. We don't want them to get really bent up like this. We want to have them flat because that will create more room and less stress in the carpal tunnel area. And so those are some things to think about, you know, with your with your desk, your monitor, your keyboard height, and your mouse. Keep your mouse close to your keyboard so you don't have to reach far away or up higher to use your mouse. That will also cause additional stress on your frame while you're working. Your work habits, think about your attitude. If you got a bad attitude sitting at your desk, it could be because you're uncomfortable and you need to adjust your workstation to fit your body a little bit better so that you can be comfortable. Another way of looking at this, I mentioned having different positions. And so you can have an upright seated position where you're sitting up pretty straight and you've got that right angle at your hips, or you could actually lower your seat. You can decline the seat, which can open up that angle at your hips a little bit, or you can do the same thing with a slight incline to open up the angle at your waist a little bit. We don't have to sit in the exact same position. In fact, we don't want to sit in the exact same position all the time. We want to be able to adjust position a little bit. And you can have multiple different positions that are ergonomically correct and allow you to change it up. You can also stand. Standing workstations are very popular these days. Look at the examples of these pictures the, on the see that the seated positions all represent that 90 degree or wider angle at the hips. The elbows also look like they have 90 degree or wider angles and the wrists look like they're nice and flat. Very good. However, we do see in this picture, especially the standing position, that this person needs to look down at the monitor. And so that monitor height, you know, is too low, especially for the standing position. So again, think about all of those adjustments so that we can maintain a good posture while we're working. Take a break every now and then. It's really important to get up, move around. Don't be in that static position uh, for too long. Take a break, you know, every 30 minutes or no more than two hours. You should never sit in the same position for, for that long. You know, every 30 minutes to, to 60, you know, maybe 120 minutes at the most. Get up, walk around, get the blood flowing. Stretching is a great way to loosen things up and to get blood flowing into your muscles and stuff where they may not be getting real good circulation when you're sitting for long periods of time. So I really am an advocate of doing some light stretching occasionally throughout the day. Another hazard that's really common in the work environment is fire hazards. And so let's talk a little bit about where those hazards are in our office place and what are some of the most common ones that we can check and address. Obviously, in an office, we tend to have a lot of combustible materials. You may have a lot of paper, a lot of paper storage uh, that you're using, and obviously paper can burn. And if you have a lot of paper, then that can make a big fire. Plastics will burn very hot also. And a lot of our furniture has plastics in it, and as well as our equipment and, and, and things around us. So those are things we want to be careful about. This is the space that we're living in while we're at work. And so we want to make sure that we are not running that risk of getting caught in a fire. 
there's other fuels, gases, or chemicals that may be in your office or workspace that we need to be aware of and make sure those are stored properly and not being exposed, especially to ignition sources if they are flammable or combustible. Electrical, electricity and sparks from electricity are a real common way we may see office fires start, as well as equipment that gets too hot. You may have a battery backup that's running too hot or other, you know, uh, electrical uh, components, electrical equipment, your computer or other things could get too hot. And so obviously that heat can, can uh, contribute to uh, fires getting started as well. And if you have open flames like uh, gas fired water heater furnaces, things like that, again, those are potential ignition sources. So what are some of the most important things we can do to control this? Well, one of the most common things that causes a fire is overloading of circuits. Like we mentioned already, a lot of us don't have enough electrical outlets in our offices. So what do we do? We plug in, you know, a surge protector and we plug in another surge protector into that surge protector. We call that daisy chaining or multiple plug adapters. And so we wind up plugging, uh, you know, six, 10, 15 items into one wall outlet. And that can lead to overloading, which can cause fire. So we need to be really careful, make sure that we have adequate you know, electrical supply for the things that we're plugging in so we're not overloading, you know, that outlet. A lot of times we think, hey, I got a surge protector that kind of protects it. Uh, surge protectors protect your equipment from damage from surges in power. And that surge protector will only protect for so long. Uh, there is, there are metals in the surge protector that every time a surge comes in, it burns off some of that metal that's providing that protection. And so when a surge protector is received, you know, most small surge protectors, when they've been hit 10 times, they're done for. They're no good for surge protection anymore. May still work as a multiple plug adapter, but then you overload them, they catch on fire. Uh, that can be a problem. So again, let's get enough electricity in our areas. You know, have an electrician come in and add more plugs if we need to and avoid that daisy chaining and overloading of those outlets using the multiple plug adapters. Also pay attention to the cords of your equipment, the things that you're plugging in, whether it's your phone charger or whether it's your copy machine. You know, if that cord is cracked or damaged, if you can see the wires inside, or especially if you can see bare metal wires in there, that cord is not safe. And that could present both a shock hazard uh, for you, your health, as well as a fire hazard. So let's make sure those cords, if they're damaged, uh, that we get those properly repaired. Another problem that we see often is out, missing outlets and switch covers. When you have open electrical like that, you don't have the switch cover on, then dust and other particles can collect in there around that switch where there is that live electrical component. And eventually if you get enough material in there, that could actually catch on fire back there. It also is the potential for sparks to come out past that cover to call the fire and there's also potential for someone getting their fingers in there and getting a shock. So let's keep those covers in place and make sure your equipment's properly grounded. So make sure you got a plug that's got all three prongs on there and that they're in good condition and the whole cord's in good condition. Another real common one we see is where in the electrical panel, uh, we've got open holes. You know, we have spots where we don't have circuit breakers and we don't have those slots covered in. Again, the same thing. We can get contaminants in there uh, that could cause some arcing or fire as well as the potential for sparks to come out and the potential for fingers to go in. And we want to make sure we're protecting everybody from that. So make sure that your electrical panels are all filled in, all the blanks are in place, and you keep the door closed on it as well. In an emergency, we need to make sure we can get to an electrical panel to shut things off. Uh, you know, if there is an electrical hazard or electrical fire going on, you know, we can get that power off. Uh, that's going to go a long ways to getting that that problem uh, resolved. We got to be able to get to these electrical panels in an emergency. So make sure that they're clear. They're not blocked. You're not stacking stuff in front of it. We need to have a, a space that's 30 inches wide by 36 inches deep in front of those electrical panels where we don't put anything on the floor, overhead, anything. It needs to be clear and we need to have a path that's clear to get in there as well. Okay, so 30 by 36 inches, we need to keep that space uh, clear. Sometimes we have 
we don't have enough storage. I mentioned that already. It's always at premium, uh, you know, storage space. And so we think we can turn our mechanical rooms into extra storage. And that's just a bad idea. So mechanical rooms, furnaces, hot water heaters, boilers, uh, other equipment like that, air handling equipment, that's not a storage room. We need to keep that space clear, especially if we're sticking a lot of combustible items in there. Uh, we've got motors running that can get hot. We've got gas, you know, natural gas going into there with fire inside those boxes. Uh, or even if it's, a, if it's electric, there's still that potential for sparks uh, that could cause a fire. So be real careful about storage in your boiler rooms and mechanical rooms. Uh, at, at a minimum, keep a space of at least 36 inches away from all of that equipment clear. Most of those rooms, if you go 36 inches away from, from the furnace or whatever, there's no room left in there. So we need to really not uh, put any combustibles or store things in those mechanical rooms. I know this time of year it's getting cold. Lots of your tootsies get a little cold during the workday, and I know a lot of you keep a heater a little you know, portable heater under your desk to help keep your feet warm. And pay attention to the condition of the cord on that. Be real careful about what you're plugging it into because this heater is probably gonna draw a lot of power. And so if we're looking at potentially overloading a circuit, uh, this, is, this is gonna be a big potential contributor. And you also wanna make sure with your portable heaters that you have a safety switch on them. Most of them, uh, built today. I mean, they should all have a safety switch. If you got a real old one around, maybe it doesn't, but you need to make sure if you tip that thing over that it automatically shuts itself off. At the potential of fire, if there is a fire in the building, we want to make sure we have enough time to get out safely. So there are certain aspects of the building that help contain fire or keep it from spreading as fast as it might. Uh, certain doors, fire doors, you know, that need to close when a, the fire alarm goes off, for example, we need to make sure those are functioning and that they work. Uh, other things could be, you know, holes in walls or missing ceiling panels. If the fire can get inside the walls or up above the ceiling, it can spread to other parts of the building a lot faster. So keep those ceiling panels in place uh, and repair holes to walls and so forth so that if there is a fire, it will take longer for that fire to spread to the rest of the building and you have time to evacuate the building safely. Extinguisher isn't just a way of putting out a fire if you need to. Uh, I mean, you may fire with a fire extinguisher if it's small and it's just barely starting. Uh, but one of the big reasons we have fire extinguishers in our workplaces is if there is a fire, we may need that fire extinguisher to help us clear exit out of the building. Uh, and so that, that's an important piece of safety equipment, both to help fight a fire as well as to help us get out of a fire. So that fire extinguisher needs to be visible. It needs to be someplace where it's marked. We should have a sign that indicates fire extinguisher where it's at. And uh, it should be mounted in such a way that it's not gonna get knocked around and get damaged. So we should have it mounted on the wall somewhere between six and 60 inches off the floor, but not just sitting on the floor. And depending on your building occupancy, in most cases, there should be a fire extinguisher within 75 feet of, you know, where people are working in the building. So check that, make sure you have enough fire extinguishers that they're close enough. In addition to having that fire extinguisher certified annually, you also need to make sure and do a monthly visual inspection of the fire extinguisher. Take a quick look at it, make sure the gauge is reading full, make sure the pin is still in, with its seal locked in place and make sure that the fire extinguisher looks like it's in good condition, that there's no damage to it. And then on the back of that tag, as you can see here, there's, there's space there for dating and initialing that you've done that monthly inspection. Life safety uh, measures in your building could be a fire suppression system like uh, fire sprinklers. Make sure that you have extra sprinkler heads on hand in case some of them get damaged. Uh, so that you don't have to take that system offline for too long. Make sure those, those uh, fire sprinkler heads don't get painted. Uh, that can affect their ability to work or, or how quickly they'll come on. So make sure those stay clean and, and paint free. And then also we need to make sure that the spray pattern from those sprinklers doesn't get blocked by other materials. 
Uh, so if you have shelves in the middle of the room and stuff on the top shelf, if they go up within 18 inches of the plane of the bottom of the of the fire sprinkler heads, that potentially could block the, the spray pattern of those sprinklers. So we need to keep any storage in the room, especially in the middle of the room away from the walls, at least 18 inches below the bottom of the, of the sprinkler head. Your fire suppression system should also be tested and certified annually by a professional. Other means uh, that we need to think about for life safety is egress, being able to get out of the building in case of a fire or other emergency. So we need to have an unobstructed you know, path out of the building. Uh, we need to have that path illuminated uh, both you know, inside as well as in the discharge area outside of the emergency exit. Your emergency exit door needs to be at least 32 inches wide, depending on occupancy level. And the width of your emergency exit path, uh, again, needs to be at least 36 inches wide, again, depending on your occupancy level, but at least 36 inches wide. The door should always swing in the direction of travel. So generally, that's going to be out and uh, into that area that should be illuminated. Uh, if you are required to have exit signs uh, because of the occupancy level of the building, which is going to be most of our buildings, that sign needs to be self-illuminated. It needs to be lit all the time. Uh, and so if you look up and your sign doesn't look like it's lit, we need to get that fixed. Also, it needs to have some sort of internal power or some sort of backup power source so that when the power goes off, that sign stays illuminated. One of the ways we make sure we do this is we test these exit signs every month. You push that little button on the bottom of the exit sign there and the light will flicker as it switches from the main power to the backup power. And when it does that, you'll know that it's working and in good condition. Uh, so make sure we do that, test those exit signs monthly, make sure they are lit up and make sure that they are switching over to their backup power. Your emergency lighting, same thing. Uh, push the button on the lighting. There's generally a button somewhere where you can push and it'll make the lights come on and then we know that our emergency lighting is working in case of an emergency. Again, test these monthly, make sure they're working. Aspects of, of emergency preparedness is first aid, making sure you have a first aid kit available and making sure that you've got people who are trained and know how to how to provide that first aid. We should all have an emergency action plan. That's a whole nother training. Uh, but have your emergency action plan and make sure your employees are trained on your emergency action plan. Have an evacuation plan and practice that evacuation plan at least once or twice a year. And again, have people who are trained to be able to provide some basic first aid in an emergency. If you have an AED on hand for cardiac events, again, we need to make sure that this equipment is properly maintained. The battery has a set life, regardless of whether it gets used or not. So do the pads, the, the, electro, the electrical pads, the uh, electrodes there. So you need to check those dates on your battery, the dates on your pads, make sure that you've got ones that are within their shelf life. Also, you need to do a, again, a documented monthly test of the AD to make sure it's working. Most of them just have a little window you can look in and you can see a little light blinking. Uh, most of them, if it just blinks once every 10 seconds or so, that's good. It means it's working. If it's blinking multiple times, you know, two or three or more times real quick, that means there's probably a problem. Or if it's not blinking at all, that's that's a problem. Some of them will just have like a little green check mark that you can see, or it'll say okay. Uh, but it, someone needs to look at it once a month and make sure that it is in working condition. And again, have trained responders who know how to use it. It's very important that we do inspections of our office on a regular basis. It should be probably monthly at least where you have your facility uh, uh, manager do an inspection and check these things and document that they've been checked. And if we have any problems, let's document the problems that existed. Don't fix them and say they were okay. Let's write down what the problems were because if they reoccur, we need to think about how do we prevent that from happening again. Also, we want to correct, we want to correct and document, document what we did to problem so that we have a record showing that we are actively engaged and reasonable and prudent in managing the safety of our facility. And that document gives us some evidence that we do that. If you've got something that needs to be fixed, but you can't fix it right now, make sure you have a plan in place 
for how and when you will be able to fix it, whether that's weeks down the road or years down the road, if it's something that requires a capital investment, have a plan if you've identified a problem. So have a documented inspection form that you do every month. Uh, this is just a little piece of a sample form and we will send these out with a copy of the slides today for everybody who's registered for the webinar so that you have a sample form that shows you some of the things that you should be looking for on a monthly basis in your workspace. Uh, there's a section on all the different areas that we've talked about today. So in summary, you know, some of the most common injuries that we see in the workplace, in the office workplace, uh, are those slip trips and falls and injuries that occur from lifting and carrying things and reaching and twisting and pulling as we're putting things away or getting things out. So managing how we store our materials and managing our walking surfaces and other aspects so that we don't have those falls and those, in those uh, lifting and, and twisting and pulling injuries is very important. Ergonomics, making sure your workspace fits your body so that your body isn't in pain while you're working. Uh, think about that 90 to 120 degree angle on your elbows, your hips, and your knees. Try to, you know, think about your wrists being straight and being able to keep your head up high above your shoulders, you know, while you're working. That'll cause a lot less stress on your neck, your shoulders, and your back. You'll be more comfortable and probably be happier while you're at work. Make sure the life safety features of your building are inspected and in good working condition. Fire extinguishers, fire sprinklers, uh, emergency lighting, exit lighting, and so forth. Uh, make sure we don't ignore those things and make sure that you have all the appropriate emergency plans and preparations in place and that you've trained your employees on those plans so that everybody needs knows what to do in case of an emergency. Questions? Anybody, anybody have any questions? You go ahead and type those into our chat box or the Q&A box and uh, we will answer those now. Great. Great job covering this subject, Doug. <clears throat> As I said to start with, a lot of people think, oh, office safety, that's a pretty small, um, small subject there. It definitely, uh, it definitely is something that uh, <laughs> is a lot bigger than most people, most people believe. Let's see. For some reason, see that question. Jill has a question there. Doug, do you, can you see that? Um, not in presentation mode. Let's see. Let's see. If under um, <clears throat> if under desk heaters are not allowed, is there an alternative? Uh, like a blanket, <laughs> <laughs> warm socks. Uh, socks, uh, you can get you can get socks that have battery packs that'll warm your feet up. Um, you know, the, the, the big thing with those heaters, you know, and maybe your office doesn't allow them, but uh, the, it's really important that you make sure that they're not too close to things that would, are combustible and that, you know, they do have that tip over safety switch and that you're not overloading the, the power supply on them. I don't know how else to get your feet warm if you can't use a heater besides, you know, put something warm on them. But uh, you may go to your outdoor store and look for some nice warm socks. And work on, you know, work on the, uh, <laughs> the uh, maintenance department to uh, make sure that we, that we have adequate you got the heat ventilated in the building appropriately, yeah. And he asked, what are the best style, best styles of heaters if we do use those? Well, you know, the, there's these heaters that are kind of, they kind of look like a radiator. Those don't get super hot. They don't have components, at least exposed components that get real hot. And I think those probably present less of a fire hazard than some where you actually see a glowing heating element in there. Uh, anything that's going to have a, you know, a red hot heating element visible, I think is probably going to be a, a little more hazardous. Uh, also, some of these, you know, other heaters uh, may draw a little less power than those that have, you know, those red hot heating elements that you can see. A couple other things that I always recommend when it comes to those heaters is, um, is make sure that they have the ground, it has the third prong on the plug. So they have a, so they're properly grounded. 
And the other thing is always make sure that if, if they tip over, they have an automatic shutoff. Um, so you can, you know, as you're purchasing one of those, you can check that. But if you've got one already, you can check that by tipping it over and seeing if it turns the, the heating element off when it's, uh, when it tips over. Um, if it's a really old heater, uh, you know, that might not be working or when it was built, that may not have been, you know, a required safety feature. I think on most of our modern space heaters, you know, if they're that hot, they, they have to have that safety switch on them. And, and probably the most important thing with those heaters is when you're not there, turn them off, unplug, unplug the thing. So, so, you know, it's, it's when they're not monitored, when a lot of these incidents can happen. If it's, if it's blowing right on your toes and it gets too hot or catches on fire, you're probably going to see that. But if you leave that running over the weekend, there's a chance we can lose our building from it. So, all right. That's the last question I see, Doug. Final word. Hey, go out there and have a safe day. Take a look at your office. Check it out. Make sure that those things we talked about today look like they're in good, proper condition. Verify that your facilities uh, personnel have a system for doing a, a documented inspection of your office spaces so we can make sure and keep them safe all the time. All right. Thanks, Doug. Awesome job. Folks, we're going to dive right back into our next webinar right away. Um, and if you want to attend that, but you haven't signed up, um, go ahead and send me an email right now <laughs> to jason at utahtrust.gov. You got a hot link to get into that, but uh, we'll close up, wrap up this webinar, and then, and then dive right into the next one at 10 o'clock. Uh, and we'll be talking about safety metrics. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it, Doug. Everybody go out and have a safe day.